I heard of two men who lived in a small village. They got into a terrible dispute with one another, and they couldn't resolve it. So they decided to go to the town's wise men. There was a sage, a wise man that lived there, and everybody went to him to uh, get the words of wisdom. So the first man went to the wise man's home. He told his version of what happened. And when he finished, the wise man said, you're absolutely right. Then the second night, the second man called on the wise man to tell his side of the story. And the wise man responded, you're absolutely right. And afterwards, the wise man's wife scolded her husband. She said, those men had two different stories, and you told them they were absolutely, absolutely right. That is impossible. They can't both be absolutely right. The man turned to his wife and said, you're absolutely right. (laughs) Guys, how many know that's a wise man? Honey, you are absolutely right. What was I thinking? To have a different opinion than you do. (laughs) So we want to talk about resolving conflict. This is a skill that you probably never learned in high school or even college and probably didn't learn it in the home. Uh, but we need to. It's vital if we're going to maintain he- healthy relationships. Uh, we've got to learn how to resolve conflicts. And if you look at me and tell me, well, we never get in conflicts. I never get in conflict. We're going to have an altar call at the end of the service for liars and see if, you can, <laughs> see if we can get you saved, get you repenting. You know, God understands that we're going to have conflicts because we live in a broken world and we live with broken people. And out of that brokenness, conflicts arise. There's differences of opinions. And out of that difference of opinion, um, conflicts will arise. That doesn't mean they're necessarily bad. And that's something I want to drill into you this morning. Conflict is not necessarily bad. It's how we handle it that either can become good or bad, result in a good outcome or, or a bad outcome. And uh, Romans 12 says this. The Bible says, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. As much as possible, as far as it depends on you, live in peace with everyone. That is the goal that God has for us, to live in peace with everyone. Now, that doesn't mean we're always going to live in peace. Listen to what the Bible said. He says, as much as possible, as far as it depends on you. It doesn't always depend on you. How many have found that to be true? There are some folks that just don't want to reconcile. They don't want to work on it. They want to hold on to the grudge. They want to be mad. They want to harbor those negative feelings, and so you're not going to be able to live at peace with them necessarily. But the Bible says as far as it depends on you, you do your part. Do everything that you can in terms of operating biblical principles, and uh, and that's really all that God asks for us to do. We can't control other people. So this morning... We want to look at seven biblical steps. I'm so glad that the Bible has something to say about resolving conflict. God doesn't leave us on our own to just figure it out, muddle through life. Uh, He's given us principles that we can operate in. And if you practice these, man, your stress in your relationships will be reduced. Your joy level and happiness will go up. Man, it'll be a good thing. Now, if we don't operate in biblical principles and we simply don't Uh, resolve our unresolved conflicts, it's going to damage our relationships. It's going to bring damage to our life. Uh, First, it's going to block my relationship uh, with my Father God. Uh, The Scripture talks about that. When I'm out of whack or out of harmony with you, then I'm going to be out of harmony with God. That's what the Scripture says. Uh, 1 John 4 says, Whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother or sister is a liar. You know, if you claim that, I mean, God, I'm, I'm, I got this great relationship going on with you, that's all that matters, and you're fighting and you're arguing, you're in conflict with other people, God says, I'm not interested in that. That's not what I'm about. Every time we get in conflict with somebody else, in some dimension, our, our relationship and our, and our fellowship with God is blocked. I mean, we still have the relationship. That never goes away. But to some degree, that, that fellowship, that communion, uh, God wants us to deal with that. It also hinders our prayers. Uh, Peter wrote to husbands primarily. He said, if you don't treat your wife correctly, if you, if you get in conflict with your spouse and you don't deal with that, then forget about the prayers getting answered. I'm just paraphrasing. You read it yourself, First Peter chapter 3. 
But that's essentially what he said. And so, you know, when you're in disharmony and conflict with your spouse, you're in disharmony with God, and uh, it affects our prayers. He wants us to get along with each other. He means business about it. He's actually pretty serious about it. And so it will affect our prayer and also hinder our happiness. You can't be in conflict with someone and, and be happy at the same time. When, when conflict comes in the door, happiness goes out the window. And so you gotta, you gotta deal with that. So let me just focus on the seven steps for the next few moments. And uh, maybe you're not in a place right now that you can apply these. Hang on, maybe next week, maybe later this afternoon. You'll have opportunity. Or you can teach somebody else. So the first stop, uh, First step to resolving conflict with your spouse, uh, with a neighbor, with a fellow employee is this, take the initiative. That's step number one if you're taking notes. Take the initiative. Don't wait for them to come to you. You decide that you're going to be a peacemaker. And you're going to take the initiative. Jesus drilled this in in Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, he said, if you're standing before the altar in the temple giving an offering to God and you suddenly remember someone has something against you, leave your offering there beside the altar and go at once, I underline that, go at once and first be reconciled to that person and then come and offer your gift to God. I mean, God's saying, don't, don't ignore this. Don't pretend that the conflict doesn't exist. Are you pretending that there's a conflict that doesn't exist, there's a problem in your marriage, there's a problem in your relationship, maybe it's sex, maybe it has to do with finances, uh, maybe it has to do with the kids, there's something, there's an elephant in the room, and, and everybody's trying to walk around it, nobody wants to, you know, ruffle anybody's feathers, but there's yet, there's this tension, there's underlying strife there, because there's, there's a, a conflict that you haven't approached, that you haven't dealt with. You know, there's a character in the novel Oliver Twist, his name is the Artful Dodger. And I think <laughs> when it comes to conflict, there's a lot of us that fit the bill there. We, we will do anything to dodge conflict, resolving conflict or, or confrontation. I'm that way. I don't like conflict. I, I don't like confrontation. And usually I'll do anything in, other than try to head on, deal with that. At least that was my, tack, uh, that was my, my plan in the past. Uh, just ignore it and maybe it'll go away. That was kind of my plan. How many know that doesn't work? Conflict doesn't go away. It actually becomes like the stinky fruit in the back of your refrigerator that you don't deal with and pretty soon it's just a mess. It's foul. You open up the refrigerator. Wow, what is that? Well, that's what happens when we don't deal with conflict in our relationships. It begins to stink the place up, stink up our heart, if, if nothing else. You ever heard the expression, time heals everything? That's baloney. <laughs> time heals nothing. I mean, if time healed everything, then all of your hurts would be healed. <laughs> all of your relationship hurts would be healed. It doesn't work that way. And that's why doctors say that 80% of the people in the hospital are there because of unresolved conflict that has spilled out from their emotions into their physical body. I read that in a medical journal, some kind of medical writing. The guy was not a Christian doctor. He said 80% of people in the hospital are there because of unresolved emotional conflict, toxic emotions due to conflicts in relationship. This is important. We need to learn how to deal with this. The only way to resolve it is to face it, right? Well, the problem is we don't like facing it because we're afraid. When it comes right down to it, we're fearful. It's intimidating to, to actually try to resolve a conflict with another person. It might be a family member, somebody in the church, somebody that you work with, a boss or employee. You know, we're afraid. We're afraid of being rejected. We're afraid of being misunderstood. Uh, we're afraid of being vulnerable because you got to get vulnerable if you're going to actually open up your heart and deal with some of these things. We're afraid of that. We don't, we don't want to go there. You know, most guys are literally afraid of dealing with conflict with their wife. 
I'm not talking about macho guys that go to war, you know, the machine guns kicking in the doors in Iraq and Afghanistan, and, and uh, the guys that, man, they'll go out and hunt down the elk, shoot an elk, and drag it back, you know, drink the blood on the way back, and I don't know if they do that, but... <laughs> But, but when their wife says, honey, we got to sit down and talk, they melt. <laughs> because that's intimidating to try to deal with a conflict with somebody. So where do we find the courage to do that? Bless God, we find it from Him. We find it from the Word of God. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, God's not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but a power, love, and a sound mind. You know, God's love and power in you is greater than the fear that would keep you from reconciling with that person. That's true. When the, when the love of God in you is greater than the fear, then you will do things that you're afraid to do. Because love conquers that fear. Love drives out the fear, right? So God can give you love for that person that's irritating you and annoying you, and you got a, you know, hard feeling story. We just need to pray, God, I'm afraid, but Lord, give me the love for that person. Help me to love that person. Help me to see that person the way you see him. And, and give me that power to take the steps that I, I need to take. So take the initiative. Let me read that passage again. Matthew 5, it said, If you're standing before the altar in the temple giving an offering to God, and you suddenly remember someone has something against you, leave your offering there beside the altar. Go at once and first be reconciled to that person, and then come and offer your gift. So he's saying if you're at church, just like this, you're worshiping God, and suddenly the Holy Spirit reminds you, how many know the Holy Spirit is faithful to do that? He reminds you of that conflict you have with that person. You know, you had a fight with your, your spouse on the way to work, yelling and screaming, then you walk in the door, you put, in your, put on your smiley face, people ask you, how are you doing? Oh, fine, <laughs> we're doing good. I mean, you're just screaming and yelling at your wife driving to the parking lot. We're good, hallelujah, everything's good, praise God. God says if you're in a conflict with somebody, you need to take care of that. He says reconciliation takes priority over worship. Wow, think about that. Even though as important as worship is to God and to us, he said uh, reconciliation takes priority over worship. He's more interested in you and I getting our relationships right than coming in here, waving our hands, singing a few hallelujahs, and looking spiritual. And sometimes we do that. God says we need to get that relationship fixed and then come to worship. I mean, Bobby and I have found that. Uh, I tell you, there's some things, there's some positive things about being in ministry. It will force you to do things that you don't want to do. And there's been many a time that, okay, there's been two or three times, let's say that, two or three times that Bobby and I have gotten in conflict. Okay, I'm lying. There has been many times that we have got in conflict during the week. But you know what? We have to resolve it before we get here on Sunday. Because you cannot get up here and preach or lead worship or be on an altar team and try to pray for somebody, minister to somebody with unresolved conflict going on. It won't work. Because you need the anointing of God to accomplish anything worthwhile in ministry, and you will not have the anointing of God on your life if you fail and refuse to deal with conflict in your life. And sometimes it's on a Sunday morning before church. You know, we hung on to the very last, you know, last opportunity, Sunday morning before we go, honey, you know, we got to talk. We got, we got to deal with this, you know. Okay, what are you feeling? What, what did I do? How did I affect you? How do those words make you feel, you know? And then we just, we, we had to talk and, and deal with that. And then we got to apologize. You got to humble yourself and, and own your part. But I'm getting ahead of myself there. But so, you know, it, it, it's important to God. And we need to go with the right attitude. Jesus tells us what kind of attitude to go with when you're going to reconcile. Because he said, go, take the initiative. But what's, what kind of attitude do we take? That is so important that we go with the right attitude. He said in Matthew 18, Jesus did, the words of Jesus, message version. He said, if a fellow believer hurts you, go and tell him, work it out between the two of you, and if, he's, and if he listens, you've made a friend. Okay, that's a little different version than this, but this is a little shorter. If a fellow believer hurts you, go and tell him, 
Work it out between the two of you, and if he listens, you've made a friend. But you know what? Because we are afraid of conflict, we don't like it, then instead of going to the person that we have the conflict with, we go to everyone else. We go to all of our friends. We post nasty comments on Facebook or social media about that person. I heard a, oh, a groan. Somebody can relate to that. But that never works. It makes things worse. We've got to avoid the behind-the-back criticism. We've got to avoid the, you know, the parking lot conversations. Well, I just want you to pray with me. I just want you to agree in prayer with me. That, that's just a guy sometimes about you just want to dump on that person about how bad that, what a jerk that other person was. So we need to go and work it out just between the two of you. And then if he listens, you've made a friend. Underline that word. Think about that. Write that down. You've made a friend. That is the attitude that you go with to make a friend, to restore the relationship. That's why you go. You don't go to blame. You don't go to criticize. You don't go to give them a piece of your mind. You can't afford to give it away anyway. You go to work on the problem, not attack each other. We got to learn that. We got to learn how to attack the problem and not the person. And if you both attack the problem and not each other, you can work it out. There will be a solution. There will be a way to resolve that or at least reconcile with one another. So if you're offended, uh, take the initiative. Just a couple practical tips. I'm spending a little bit more time on this point than I will the others, but choose the right time. Timing is critical. You may be ready to talk, but are they? It has to be a good time for both of you. And then choose the right place, a place where there's no distractions, uh, you know, a place that you're both comfortable with, and then pray before the meeting. Just pray and get your own heart right. You know, get rid of any bitterness. Forgive. It's so important. Bobby and I discovered this in our relationship. There might be offense there, but if we go without praying, then all of that anger and frustration spills out on each other. But if we pray about it and we deal with the anger and the frustration, we deal with the offense, we take it to God, we pour out our complaints upon him, and we ask God to forgive us for our bitterness, we forgive the other person, then when we go, we've drained out all that negative energy. And we can actually sit down and talk, sit down and communicate. You know, we failed to do that the first five or six years of our life. And, and we could never have a conversation about anything that had to do with issues. Never, ever. We tried over and over again. And, and, and it, it wasn't more than like two or three minutes, and it would begin to escalate. You know, one person would blame the other one. The other person would get defensive, start blaming that person. And then the emotions start going up. And pretty soon, man, we're, 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 yeah, we're having a discussion. Hallelujah. So, take the initiative. Number two, confess my part of the conflict. My part. You know, the Scripture says, confess your faults to one another and pray for one another that, that you may be healed. Instead of taking that to heart, what we like to do is confess somebody else's fault. Isn't that fun? Isn't that fun to confess somebody else's faults? Kind of point the finger at them? That's a good time. Yeah, it doesn't work, though. You know, you may be 90% right, and they're 10%, excuse me, you may be, let me see. Start that out. Yeah, you may be 90% right and 10% wrong, but instead of going, pointing out their 90%, we, you need to go, you and I, we need to go and confess our 10%. I had to learn that in our relationship, the many times that I was 10% wrong and she was 90% right. I had to learn that. Yeah. That's called Humility. When we just own our part, and, you know, instead of attacking and blaming, you know, we just, we humble ourselves. We start with my part. You know, everybody's got blind spots, right? I mean, some of us got bald spots, but everybody's got blind spots. And, and Jesus, he talked about that in the Sermon on the Mountain, Matthew 7. He said, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? I think people just rolled in laughter when he said that. I think that was probably the funniest thing on the Sermon of the Mount. I think there was a lot of, I think Jesus taught with humor all the time. You know, he says, you're dealing with, you're trying to take this little speck, 
a little speck of sawdust out of your brother's eye, but you got this huge plank, you got this telephone pole coming out of your own eye. And I think people thought, you know, probably rolled in laughter, that's ludicrous. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, while all the time there's this plank, this telephone pole in your eye. You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck in your brother's eye. So humility is, is owning my part of the conflict. And that's where you start, with my part. Because humility goes a long ways to reconciling relationships. I think it's one of the greatest keys. The more humble you can get, the more reconcilable you become. <laughs> I think I just made up a word, but that's all right. Proverbs 18, 12 says, before the... Before a downfall, the heart is haughty, but humility comes before honor. And God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Step number three is listen for the hurt. Listen for the hurt. When you're dealing with somebody that's been offended, uh, where there's distance between you and somebody else, you know the old saying, and you know this, hurt people hurt people. Isn't that true? When we get hurt, we hurt the people in our lives. And maybe you are the one that's hurt that person. <laughs> or maybe it's somebody else that's done the hurting. But either way, if they're hurting you, then they have hurt in their life. And so you have to listen for the hurt in the middle of the conflict. Not just the words. They're saying listening is more than hearing words. It's, it's understanding where somebody's coming from putting your feet in their moccasins and walking the mile, so to speak. It doesn't matter if it's, it's in your marriage, it's in the marketplace, it's in your neighborhood. Uh, we need to learn how to hear uh, the hurt that people have. Because when people are hurt, they get angry. Isn't that true? And when you get angry, that's when you get in, in conflict with people. So if you want to connect with somebody, you've got to start with their need, and their need is their hurt, the thing, the, the thing that they're feeling. And we want to come with our need. But if everybody comes with their need, nothing gets reconciled. Somebody's got to be the bigger person in the situation. And I believe that becoming a good listener is one of the greatest relationship building skills that you will ever develop. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago about listening, listening skills. But if you, if you focus on becoming not just a good communicator because everybody likes to talk and most people do a pretty good job at it, but we're pretty poor at listening. And so if we focus on just building those listening skills, becoming a good listener, God gave us two ears and one mouth. I think we ought to listen twice as much as we talk, right? The Bible talks about that. He said in James 1.19, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. So when you really listen to somebody, that's when you begin to diffuse that conflict. Their anger level will come down. They'll be more apt to want to listen to you and your side of the story. But, uh, you know, we need to practice that. If you practice James 1.19, I bet you'd save yourself, you know, thousands of dollars in the counseling office, right? Down to the downtown, you go to these, it, it's a minimum of $85 an hour up to $250 an hour to get professional counseling. You can save yourself a lot of problems. Just learn to be a good listener. Number four, consider their perspective. We're talking about biblical steps to resolving conflict. Consider the way they're looking at things. Consider their point of view, and everybody has one. Intentionally shift your focus from your needs. Shift your focus from, you know, I'm going to win this argument. Bless God if it's the last thing I do. Shift your focus from that to learning to understand where they're coming from. Philippians 2, it's interesting that this scripture has come up probably four or five times in the last seven or eight weeks that we've done this scripture. It just keeps popping up over and over again. Let's just read this together, shall we? Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ. There's a famous prayer by St. Francis of Assisi. He's, he prayed this, grant that I may not so much seek to be understood as to understand. Seek to understand, then be understood. 
I tell you, that would cut your relationships by half, if not 75 or 85 percent right there. Number five, I'm just kind of rushing through these, tell the truth tactfully. We do need to speak the truth, right? The Bible said speak the truth in love, and when we go to resolve a conflict, we got to be real, we got to be honest, but man, we got to learn how to speak the truth tactfully. Speak the truth in love, Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 4. I have had people speak the truth to me, but there was no love in it, and it felt like I got hit over the head with a metal frying pan when it was all said and done. Man, I felt like an inch high. I felt like I had just been emotionally demolished by the truth. And I had to recognize it was probably the truth, but man, there was no love in it. And it was not endearing, it did not endear me to them at all, and it certainly did nothing to reconcile uh, the relationship. The scripture has something to say about that. Proverbs 12, 18 says, Careless words stab like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Careless, reckless words pierce like a sword. Another verse said, stab like a sword, but the tongue of the, the wise brings healing. Careless words, reckless words are those words that you speak when you're in an argument with somebody and the tempers go up, the emotions are, 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 are rising up, it's red hot, and you say some things that come to the tip of your tongue, just off the top of your head, and then later you regret those. Has anybody ever done that besides me? I wish, probably above all things, probably the, I would say probably the number one regret in my life is words that I have spoken when I was angry, when I was upset. And I wish I could get them back, but I can't. It's too late. Now, we can do what we can to reconcile that. And we do need to do that. We need to go. We need to apologize we need to say, I was wrong. Those were wrong words. I should not have said those. And hopefully that person will have the grace to forgive you and want to reconcile. But sometimes it takes a long time for people to get over reckless words that pierce like a sword. And sometimes, I think there's times when a, when a, when a relationship may be irreparably damaged if the other person doesn't have the interest to work it out. So we've got to be very, very careful. Foolish words hurt, but wise words heal. As one person said, you're never persuasive when you're abrasive. I wish I could just remember that at all the right times. <laughs> I'm never persuasive when I'm abrasive. Ephesians 4.29, this is a key verse when it comes to our words. Do not use harmful words, but only helpful words. The kind that build up and provide what is needed. Don't use harmful words, only helpful words, the kind that builds up and, and edifies. So here's what needs to happen. I need to pause before I speak. That is so important. If we could just learn that one. If I need to pause before I'm, I speak, and I need to ask myself, are these words going to be harmful, or are these words going to be helpful? Are these words going to build up, or are they going to tear down? Are these words going to be persuasive, or are they going to be abrasive? If I would just pause before I speak and think about it and maybe say a quick one-second prayer, God, help me to say the right thing. And hold back the words that sometimes everything in you wants to say. Man, we feel like we just got to get the last word. I just got to get this off my chest. No, you don't. It's called self-control. God's not given a spirit of fear, but a power of love and of self-control. We have the ability to control ourselves, control our tongue, zip it, zip the lip, and say only the things that will be beneficial in that relationship. Do we all the time? No. Sometimes we just refuse. We say, bless God, I'm going to let it rip. Let the chips fall where they may. But then you've got to go pick up all the pieces. Then you've got to humble yourself. I don't like apologizing, frankly. I mean, I do it because it's necessary, but it's not fun. It'd be better not to have to go there in the first place, right? And if we do this, then we'll learn how to attack the problem and not the person. A lot of us don't, never learn that. You know, we just go through conflict, attacking one another, blaming one another. You know, we really need to 
learn some of these principles. And then number six, fix the problem and not the blame. Fix the problem and not the blame. You know, when you're in a conflict with other person, you only have so much emotional energy. And you're going to use that up either fixing the problem, focusing on the problem, or trying to fix the blame on that other person. The Bible says, let's stop passing judgment on one another. How many know that's an age-old problem that started all the way back in the Garden of Eden? Fixing the problem, or excuse me, fixing the blame instead of the problem? You know, Adam said, it's that woman that you gave me. The woman said, it's the serpent, you know, and just keep finding somebody else to, to blame. The Bible says, let's stop passing judgment on one another. Apostle Paul wrote that on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I'm not sure what his attitude was at the moment, but I just kind of got this sense that he may be a little bit frustrated at what he observed was what was going on. He said, let's just stop passing judgment. Can we do that? Can we just pat, stop passing judgment on one another just for a moment? Time out. Let's quit going there. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. You know, we have two choices. We're either going to blame or we're going to work on ourselves. And, 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 and Paul is saying, quit, quit passing the blame and just try to be the best person you can be. Work on me before we work on we. That's a good thing, right? Might want to write that down. I need to work on me before we work on we. I need to get myself right. I need to get the judgment out of my heart. I need to get the criticism. I need to get that fault-finding spirit out of my heart. You know, that's dangerous. That is so dangerous to, to let that to grow and develop, that kind of that fault-finding, you know, pointing the finger. I had a friend growing up that that guy had so much potential. He could have been one of the greatest track athletes this town has ever known. But, but he quit one track team after the other because it was always the coach's fault. Coach never coached me like he should have. The coach didn't, you know, treat me like I should have. He didn't put me in the right events. And, and then he, got, he took that into his adult life. And, you know, he's absolutely gifted when it comes to working with wood and working with his hands. But he's really never made a success of his life because he's always blaming somebody else. That's dangerous. Blaming is a form of judging. And God is the only one that has the right to judge. We don't know other people's motives. And that's what we judge, don't we? We judge their intention. We judge our actions and we judge other people's intentions. That's how it works. That's how we normally do it. But God said don't even try to judge another, people's motive, another person's motives because you don't know. Only God knows the motives. So we need to stay away from that. And listen, when we fight, in times we need to fight, we need to learn how to fight fair, there's certain words that should never be used. They are WMDs in your relationship. You know what those are? Weapons of mass destruction. There are certain words that we should never use. You know, when, during the height of the Cold War, America had hundreds if not thousands of intercontinental missiles aimed at Russia, and Russia had thousands aimed at us, and if they had wanted to, they could have used them all, and we would have blown each other up. Thank God the leadership had the sanity to say there's certain weapons that we're not going to use against each other because we will obliterate and annihilate one another. And, and we need to set some ground rules when it comes to having discussions and those fights that we have every once in a while, conflicts. Uh, we, we need to set the ground rules and say there's certain words, there's certain things that we're never going to say. If you're married, this has to do with married couple, the D word should never be used. You know what that is? Threatening divorce. Well, I've just about had it with you. I'm going to go get a divorce. I'm done with this. I can't take this anymore. I'm going down to the judge, and we're, we're going down to the courthouse, and, I'm, I'm, and you may not even be serious about that. Maybe you're just angry at the time. But those are weapons of mass destruction. Those are devastating. Those erode the trust that you have with your spouse, with your partner. We need to not use those. The Bible gives us another list. Colossians 3 said, you must rid yourself of all these. And here's the list. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. He said, these are WMDs, weapons of mass destruction. Don't use them. You know what malice is? Malice is words designed to hurt. 
You know, sometimes we hurt each other unintentionally. Other times, we do it on purpose. We know the words to say. You know how to say. There's certain things that you can say that you know will push that person's buttons and get them hot, trigger them, just kind of like drive that dagger in and just turn it a little bit, just, you know. Those are WMDs. We need to get rid of those. And then slander. What's slander? It's insults. It's slurs. It's name-calling. Man, how many times has that happened? Just name-call, belittling. That, there should be no room for belittling. Someone said, I think it was Rick Warren said, uh, little people belittle, belittle others. Little people belittle people. And it just shows, when we belittle people, it shows the smallest of our own hearts when we do that. We need to get those WMDs out. Sorry, they're just not allowed. And then finally, here's the last step to biblical resolution, not resolution, but uh, resolving conflict, is focus on reconciliation, not resolution. Focus on reconciling with that person, not resolving every single issue. There's a difference. Reconciliation means reestablishing the relationship. That's, that's the goal. The goal is to reestablish the relationship. Like Jesus said, go and make a friend. Satan wants to divide and, and conquer you, but, but God wants you to reestablish the relationship. He wants to help you renew the friendship. The relationship is so important. Now, resolution, that's different. Resolution means that we resolve every issue. You know, we, we, but we come to a conclusion that, uh, you know, every single, you know, we disagree on everything. How many know that you're not always going to agree on everything with any person on the planet? Especially people that you live with. You cannot totally resolve every single issue. Why? Because we are always going to have a difference of opinion to some degree with everybody. Can you have a loving relationship with someone and not agree on everything? What do you think? Absolutely. How many know you can learn to agree, disagree? Let me say that. How how does that go? You can learn to agree. Disagree agreeably. That's how it goes. (laughs) You can learn to disagree agreeably. Am I saying that right? Yeah. You can agree to disagree. That's that's easy. You can learn to walk in unity without uniformity. Doesn't mean we're cookie cutter. Everybody just agrees on everything. You can walk hand in hand without seeing eye to eye on everything. That's humility. That's that's wisdom. That's where God has called us to, to walk. He's called us to live in unity. And folks, it is so important that we walk in unity. I don't know if there's any unresolved conflict among us here today, I would imagine in a congregation this size there probably is, either at home or here at the church or at work. But it is so important that we learn how to walk in unity because the Bible says in Psalms 133, if God can find a group of people walking in unity, there he commands a blessing. And we want that blessing. We so desperately need the blessing of God. So I want to challenge you this morning to become an agent of reconciliation. Would you do that? I think one of the greatest things that we can do is become bridge builders and not wall builders. It's easy to become a wall builder. I mean, you get hurt and you just cut the person off. Man, I don't want anything to do with you. But God has called us to be bridge builders. And that's who Jesus has been to us. At one time, we were not reconciled with God. At one time, uh, there was a hostility between God and, and us. But, but God was that bridge builder. He came and sent Jesus, his son, to die for our sins. He took the initiative. He took the first step to come and build that bridge between us and give us that opportunity to reestablish that relationship with him. 